a series entitled Samsonite versus Kryptonite based on the life of Samson in the book of Judges. And we know that Samson was the strongest man the Bible ever recorded. He was also extremely intelligent as we saw uh, uh, in, in, in the message two weeks ago. And now we see that he has the brains, he has the brawn, but he necessarily did not fulfill all of God's purposes. And so he also has some weaknesses, great strengths and weak, great weaknesses associated with that. And today is part five and it's found in Judges chapter 14, verses 19 to 20. Judges chapter 14, verses 19 through 20. And then um, mark your finger there. And also then right afterwards, we're gonna go to chapter 15, verses one through eight. Judges 14, 19 to 20, and then chapter 15, verses one through eight. If you found it, just let me know by saying out loud, amen, okay? Yeah. Let me read out loud God's holy word if you'll silently read along with me. Judges 14, 19, 20. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, that is Samson, and he went down to Ascalon and struck down 30 men of the town and took their spoil and gave the garment to those who had told the riddle. Uh, this is the context is he gave a riddle to the men of his fiance, the Philistine woman fiance, and gave a riddle and they answered it because they were able to uh, just kind of uh, coerce his fiance, his bride to be, to give the answer. And so therefore he owed them, these dirty men, some new garments. And so he goes to a different town and kills these men and then he gives them these garments. And that's the context right here. So he told, uh, gave the garments to those who had told the riddle. In hot anger, everybody say hot anger. Okay. <laughs> Everybody say even louder, hot anger, okay? So he's really mad. The Bible's saying he's really, he went back to his father's house. He left his fiance because he's pissed off at her. You betrayed me. I told you my secret and you gave it away. So he went back to his father's house and Samson's wife was given to his companion, other translations to his best man of the wedding party, which happens to be a Philistine because Samson didn't have any friends. He was a loner because he was so strong, he, didn't, he thought he didn't need anyone. So, so Samson's wife was given to his companion, who had been his best man. Now skip on down to uh, the next chapter, chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. After some days, everybody say some days, okay? At the time of wheat harvest, Samson went to visit his wife. By your mind, wife here, because engagement is such a serious thing, it's almost like being considered a wife, but they hadn't fully been married. But that's why the Bible says it's like that, like a wife. Samson went to visit his wife, the one he had left before, with a young goat. Everybody say, that's romantic, okay? <laughs> went to visit his wife with a young goat. And he said, I will go into my wife in the chamber. But her father would not allow him to go in. And her father said, I really thought that you utterly hated her. So I gave her to your companion. Is not her younger sister more beautiful than she? Man, that's a pretty bad letdown, isn't it? Her own father <laughs> saying, here's my, younger, uh, my daughter better than her anyway. Isn't she more beautiful than she? Please take her instead. Verse 3, and Samson said to them, this time I shall be innocent in regard to the Philistines when I do them harm. So Samson went and caught 300 foxes. Some other translations say jackals. There's a debate amongst scholars. Was it foxes? They tend to be loners. Then maybe that's symbolic of Samson being a loner. Or were they actually more like jackals because he could gather them more quickly? Caught 300 fox, uh, foxes and to took torches. And he turned them tail to tail and put a torch between each pair of tails. And when he had set fire to the torches, he let the foxes go into the standing grain of the Philistines and set fire to the stacked grain and the standing grain, to all the words, all, all the farms there, as well as to the olive orchards. Then the Philistines said, who has done this? And they said, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he has taken his, his wife and given her to his companion. And the Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. And Samson said to them, If this is what you do, I swear I will be avenged on you, and after that I will quit. And he struck them hip and thigh with a great blow. And he went down and stayed in the cleft of the rock of Edom. In other words, he ran and hid afterwards. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, I thank you for this time. And Lord, I pray 
that you would just have your way and speak to all your people, uh, whether it be youth, whether it be people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, or even 50s or 60s, Lord, speak only your words. And I pray that it will speak to the exact season of wherever they are. Lord, uh, would you tailor it, that it will be not just information, but really transformation in whatever they're facing, whatever their life stage may be. You're the God of all ages, God. So speak at this time to all ages here present. And use me as your mouthpiece, God. And Lord, if there's someone that needs to give their life to you today, do it, Lord, in your name. If there's someone who knows you that's fallen away, bring them back to you. And if there are those who need to be healed, heal them in the mighty name of Jesus. Let us get out of the way and let you work, Holy Spirit. And to that end, Lord, I surrender myself and the service and everyone into your hands. We surrender to you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And everyone said, amen. Oh, you can do better than that. I know it's a little hot in here, but let's get even hotter for God. Somebody shout amen. amen. Okay. I know when you get a little hot, you want to conserve your energy, but that's how I want to, I want to let you. I don't want to be the only one getting sweaty up on the stage here. I commission all of you to get sweaty, all right? So point to someone and say, you need to get some sweat, all right? You need to get some sweat, all right? Point to someone next to you, you need to say some sweat. So if you get excited about God's word, don't be shy, but I want to just make sure that we want to just kind of cool off, but we need to get fired up for the Lord. So I want um, everyone, if you're excited to be here and you're ready to receive God's word, somebody shout hallelujah, hallelujah. okay? Yeah. You can do best. Somebody shout hallelujah, all right? Hallelujah. It, just because we're so spoiled by nice air conditioning, if one God might actually make a little slowdown, you're not here for the air conditioning, you're here for Jesus Christ. You're not here for a but for Jay-Z, Jesus Christ. So if you believe that, somebody shout, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God is good. Even when it's out, God is good. All and all the time. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Come on and give him a hand clap of praise because he's worthy of it. Let's give him praise. You know, uh, a few years ago, when my son was young enough to be in a booster seat, uh, it was 4th of July. And I still remember it well because... You know, I'm one of those types because when you're busy with ministry, I'm bad at planning family trips. Confession. Even today, my son's like, do you have anything planned for? Uh, no. God has a plan, I <laughs> say, right? And he's like, oh, you never, and, uh, but a few years ago when my son was younger, he had to be in a, a booster chair. We were uh, just driving around, spending family time, and it was uh, 4th of July that day, and then we're thinking, where should we go? Okay, let, let's, let's go maybe for North Orange County to look some fire, uh, see some fireworks. And we were right near uh, Newport Beach area, and we're driving, and uh, I remember it so loud and clear, because I was, at that time we had a, um, a Honda Odyssey minivan, and I was driving, and my son was right behind me, and my daughter's in the, uh, in, uh, behind his mom, and my wife's in the front passenger seat on the right side, and we're driving. I remember there was a uh, uh, like a charcoal gray 3 Series BMW. And I know that their car was no good. You know why? I saw these young guys. One had like a, like a surfboard kind of sticking out of the window. And then they were all cramped in the back and I saw the one guy in the passenger seat he had his feet up on the dash and the windows were rolled down. I'm thinking, oh man, those look like some young guys. What are they doing driving a BMW like that? So they were, um, uh, they were uh, to my left, and I'm driving, and I'm, 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 not, I'm not making this, I was following the speed limit. I was not speeding. And so um, I'm driving, and I, I just happened to be passing them a little bit, and they were coming to Ford, I think Ford Road, or there's a light. And uh, so they're, in, they're to my left, I'm right here, and then there's a turning area that's coming, and all of a sudden, I lost sight of the car. I'm thinking, where are these guys? And then I hear this... <laughs> crashing into the passenger side where my son, the driver sliding door is for the minivan, and he just <laughs> So I'm braking, they're braking, and then I, I come to a stop, and, I'm, and I, I pull over to the curb, because it's, it's an accident, so we need to you know, stop and get information and all that. And I notice as I look through the room, the car, that car didn't stop, but at the turn at Ford Road, or Ford Street, whatever it is, they made a right and they took off and sped. So here I am turning on my blinkers. Oh, you guys okay? You guys okay? And my wife's, oh, oh my God, we're, gonna, we're in an accident. We're in a car accident. And then uh, I'm like, man, those guys took off. So I came out of the car and I was looking and, and they sped off and they disappeared. And my wife's like, what are you going to do? I'm like, I, I can't turn the car around like this. I mean, because there's just a middle median now. We went past the intersection. So I can't. So, uh, and they left behind the front, you know, turning light. They crashed into my car so that the turning light fell off. So I waited, we called 911 and the police came, Newport uh, uh, police came, 
and um, uh, make a long story short, I said, I, I couldn't get the driver's license as well. And I said, well, what about, can you see the serial number of this thing? They said, it's kind of scraped up, so I'm sorry, there's nothing we could do about it. But when we're in the car again, I'm mad. One thing, I'm like, those young kids, how dare they? They have no honor. They can't even stick around. They took off like this. Where's the justice in this, in God? And I was so mad, and I was getting all worked up. And I was really getting upset, like, Lord, all we're doing is family time. Why would you allow this to happen? And this happens, God. And then I was really getting upset, and I looked in my rearview mirror, and I saw my son, and I saw my daughter. So, you know, and I said, you know, I can't believe this. But you know what, guys? Praise God anyway. And it was forced, okay? <laughs> I didn't feel like it, but I was like, praise God anyway. Praise God that the door, you know, it's, it's not as bad as it can be. Praise God that even though the sliding door was dented in and scratched up, it still opens automatically and closes. Praise God anyway. I was saying that, and then all of a sudden my son, you know, he's still young, he's in a booster site. Yeah, mommy, daddy, praise God anyway. I could have died. <laughs> I could have like flown through the window and crashed. I could have died. Praise God anyway. I say, you're right, Colin. Let's praise God anyway. I said to my, praise, Kara, say praise God. She goes, praise God. <laughs> but inside, I'm like, okay, I'm thankful that my, my son didn't get hurt and all that, but God, I have a damaged car, and where's the justice? So I was so upset we didn't go to North Orange County. I was driving around, I don't know what to do, honey, what are we going to do? Okay, and then we decided, oh, let's try to find some place for fireworks in Newport Beach. And we just found a place, and we just parked the car, and it ended up being the best location to see the fireworks in Newport Beach. We were like, wow! And the kids were like, wow! And what actually turned out to be a huge disappointment and a major bummer in our lives, we were able to redeem goodness out of that. So in other words, we were able to upset the disappointment. And I want to challenge you, you're going to be filled with disappointments. Why? Disappointments are dis appointments. It's not what God might have necessarily intended for you, and therefore what you're hoping for may be disappointments, but it's not something that God might have appointed. But when you know and trust in God, you could upset that disappointment. Are you trying with me? Can I get an amen, all right? So that's the thing I want to share with you, and that's the sermon title for here today, that we can learn from Samson's anger, his disappointments, over his disappointments, how to succeed and overcome your disappointments. So everybody take your right hand and finger, stretch it out to the heavens above. If you're a newcomer, you're wondering, what's he asking me to do? We like to get uh, interactive and, and uh, really caught up in God's way. Everybody take your right hand and finger, stretch it out. I want to see everyone's hands and arms are raised up high. Receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit and point to three people behind your diagram cross and say, you need to upset your disappointment. You need to upset your disappointment. Say it like you mean it, me like I say, you need to upset your disappointment. You need to upset your disappointment. If you agree with that, can I get an amen? All right? First thing I want to share with you, we see in the life of Samson here is that passion. Everybody say passion. passion. All right? Say it with passion. Everybody say passion. Okay? Passion. passion is from God, and it is a good thing, but it is good only when it's used for God-intended ways. What do I get this? Look here in verse 19 20. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, convicted him, and ushered him. And he went down to Ascalon and struck down 30 men of the town. Finally, Samson's doing what God had told him to do defeat the enemies of God's people and fight for God's people. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and he went down to Ascalon and struck down 30 men of the town and took their spoil and gave them, gave the garments of those who had told the riddle. He's doing this in anger. And in hot anger, he, after he does this, he goes back to his father's house and Samson's wife was given to his companion who had been his best man and then verse, uh, 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 chapter 15 verses uh, the verses there 1 through 2 after some days at the time of harvest Samson went to visit his wife with a young goat and I said I know that I asked you to say that seems romantic but you have to understand a young goat was very very precious back then smelly goat <laughs> here honey this is my romantic gift for you <laughs> 
but it was considered a value. Therefore, it was considered a precious commodity. So you can't think of it just as a goat. It's considered, wow, this is something valuable. You're bringing this to me. And he brought in a goat, and he said, I'll go to my, to, into my wife in the chamber, but her father would not allow him to go in. And her father said, I really thought you utterly hated her, so I gave her to your companion. Is not her younger sister more beautiful than she? So please take her instead. What we see when we read into these verses, we know that Samson is so strong, physically gifted with strength. We know that he's also very intelligent because the way that he was able to come up with the widow, God gave him brains and brawn. But we also see along with that, God gave Samson passion. And every one of God's people has passion. All of us, God has given us a certain passion for. Everybody say passion, okay? Now, passion is not necessarily a bad thing, uh, but it's a good thing. And God created it. Why? Because God is passionate. God is so passionate right now. He's so pleased that you're here more than at Regal Cinema watching Finding Dory. More than in a barbecue because you'd rather put God first and come into the house of the Lord and say, I'd rather be in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. I'd rather be worshiping God instead of hearing a song by Taylor Swift over the radio right now. I'd rather be feasting upon God's word. Later on, I'm going to eat some nice 4th of July barbecue. But right now, I'm going to feast upon God's word. God is passionate and he's pleased with you. He's passionate that he created you. He's passionate he gave you your name before your parents even knew what name to give you. He's passionate that he created you for a destiny. He's passionate about all the broken people. If you come from a broken family, he was passionate to bring you back and to heal you no matter how broken your family might have been. If you come from a broken divorce, divorce setting, God says, I'm passionate for you and I'm not going to let you wallow in your suffering. I'm not going to let you continue in your lack. I am the God that fills your cup and make you overflow. Can I get a loud amen to that? So God is passionate. And that's why the word passion of Christ, he's so passionate. In the original Latin word, pati, passion, that we get the word passion, it means to suffer. You're so in love, so passionate that you're suffering for it. That's why the passion of Christ, he, it's really the suffering of Christ out of his love for us. That he died, he carried that heavy log, even though his back was ripped open because the centurions and soldiers had whipped him with the ends with pieces of metal and bone and ripped his back open. And he carried it, not because he had to, but because out of love. And when he died on that cross and nails were placed upon him, he could have at any moment called his angels, this is enough, and the angels would have come and obeyed him. But he stuck it through to the end because he saw the joy set for it before him, seeing you and you and you, that you would one day accept him and receive his free gift of salvation. Can I get an amen to that? That's why passion. And we're all passionate. And if you look at even some um, secular translations, like for instance, the Cambridge Dictionary of Passion, it's an emotion, a powerful emotion or feeling, or it's a powerful expression of that emotion or feeling. It's like, you know, like uh, passion, like we take get worldly ideas today from, from television and from the media and from the arts. Remember Shakespeare's uh, Romeo and Juliet. Oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore thou art Romeo? Deny thy father and refuse thy name if thou wilt not but be sworn by in love and I will no longer be a Capulet. And then Romeo says his romantic words. She speaks. Oh, speak again, bright angel, for thou art as glorious to this night being over my head as is a winged messenger of heaven unto the white upturned wondering eyes of mortals that fall back to gaze on him when the bestrides the lacing piercing clouds and sails upon the bosom of the air. We get so caught up with those things like passionate love. You see Hollywood and you think, wow, that's love. And Hollywood says, if you feel it, that's love. When it's not, it's no longer love in that way. Or strong interest, something that you're strongly interested in and enjoy. For instance, he has two passions in life. He has a passion for cats and the opera. Or, as I said, the passion of Christ. Now, let me be very clear. Every human being has passion. Point to someone and say, you have passion. Point to someone and say, you have passion. Everybody has been wired by God to be passionate about something. Even the most unseemingly unpassionate person has passion. 
I've had someone come to me and say, Pastor, I'm really serious. I'm not passionate about anything. I said, you're passionate about not being passionate about anything right now. <laughs> so you just tell me, I'm, not, I'm really not passionate about anything. All of us have some type of passion for something. It may not be readily available or apparent, but we all have it. Some of us are passionate about eating donuts or has a sweet tooth. Some of you are passionate about food. You're a food connoisseur. You just love to eat. Some of you are passionate about shopping. Can I get an amen from the sisters? I know I, uh, I was going to be uh, a little muted there. I know that. I know. Some of you are passionate about just having fun. Some of you are passionate about getting married. Some of you are passionate about your job. Some of you are passionate about teaching. Some of you are passionate about never being pure, pure or poor or the way that you grew up. You never want to ever say, face that again. Some of you are passionate about books. Some of you are passionate about music. Some of you are passionate about fashion. Some of you are passionate about your kids. Some of you are passionate about your cars. Some of you are passionate about helping the poor and justice. Some of you are passionate about church. Some of you are passionate about coming to church. Now that's a plug to say amen. Somebody say amen. And amen to that. Amen. Some of you are passionate about revival church. That's the book saying somebody say even louder amen to that. Amen. And some of you are passionate about worshiping God. That's the loudest amen. Somebody shout amen to that. Amen. We're all passionate about something. And if we're all passionate about something, that means that God has wired us for that. And Samson was a passionate man. He was prone to anger. And we know that anger is not a sin. It says, do not let your anger lead you into sin. Anger is a holy emotion when it's used right. God gets angry, but he never sins. But we sometimes, you know, you get angry, and the Holy Spirit is saying, don't say it. Don't say it, don't do it. And then you do it, right? And then it leads into sin. But God gets angry, righteous indignation, but he never sins in that way. And like Samson, he had great talents, great strengths, and great skills, and he had great passion. In this case, for physical pleasures. He was supposed to stay away from wine, but he could not keep him away from that. And he also see, we had, he has a passion in his physical strength and his physical prowess. He had a physical weakness as well for women. I mean, think about it. Who in their right mind will go back to the woman who betrayed him? Samson, tell me the riddle answer. I can't. I, my, my mom and dad, I haven't even told. And she's like, come on, Samson, come on. If you love me, you do it. And he tells her, and then he tells his enemies. And so that's why he leaves off in her anger and rage. But he's got such a weakness for this. He says, oh, I'm going to go back to her after some time. I'm going to take a goat. Hey, father-in-law to be, I'd like to see my, uh, my fiance. No, no, I'm sorry. I, I've given her somewhere, away to someone else. And he gets out angry, and then he's let his anger and passion go further in that way. And let me, let me share this point with you. When you're not doing the right thing that God intended, God will give you a disappointment to move you to do his appointed thing. Can you track me? When you're not doing the right thing, sometimes God in his love will actually give you a disappointment to move you to the place and to what he wants you to do, his appointed thing. And Samson did not want to fight the Philistines. He was all doing it for his own thing. And because of that, God allowed him to experience a disappointment. His wife betrays him. And then he goes back and he finds out that his wife's been given off. And he doesn't get what he wants. And therefore, he goes off in a rage. And that even still, God used that. Because God says, I want you to fight the Philistines. And because he's so disappointed, finally he's prompted into that. And he starts fighting the people, the enemies of Israel in that way. And so in the same way, I want to challenge some of you. If you're going through a disappointment... God might be trying to lovingly move you and nudge you to the place that he wants you to be and to start doing the things that God wants you to do. If you track with me, can I get an amen to that, right? That's the first thing. The passion is good, and it's, it's from God, but it's good when you do it according to God's intended ways. But it doesn't stop there. The second thing I want to share with you is that you need to keep honing. Everybody say honing, okay? And developing your gifts. Point to someone and say, you better keep developing your gifts. Point to someone next to you and say, you better keep developing your gifts. What do I get this? Keep honing and developing your gifts and talents despite the disappointments. Verse 3 to 5 says this. And Samson said to him, this time I shall be innocent in regard to the Philistines when I do them harm. So Samson went and caught 300 foxes and took torches, and he turned them tail to tail and put a torch between each pair of the tails. And when he had set fire to the torches, he let the foxes go into the standing grain of the Philistines. You see, God finally moves and pushes him to start doing the things that God wants. He wanted him to lead the people of Israel to fight against the Philistines. Instead, he was wanting to marry the Philistines. 
And because that God gave him disappointment to prompt him and his passion and anger, and, okay, I'm going to start doing these things, and God's finally forcing him to do the things that God wants him to do. And because of that, he, you see here that God is allowing his gifts, even though he may be doing it at anger, God's still using that to try to hone and prepare him for the gifts that God's given to you. And I want to challenge everyone, the good news of the Church of Jesus Christ, every Sunday, any sanctuary is filled with overriding potential. Every room, every row, every seat, I don't care if you feel like you're a nobody. God said you are somebody worth enough to die on the cross of Calvary. Can I get an amen to that? I don't care if your IQ is lower than somebody else's. You need the wisdom of God that overcomes all of man's IQ. Can I get a hallelujah to that? I don't care if you have a white collar job or a blue collar job. If it's God's appointed job for you, you can glorify God better than anyone else if you're doing God's purpose right there. Can I get a praise to the Lord to that? So if you're doing God's will and you're being faithful to that and that way you need to hone your gifts everyone is part of the gifted and talented club every one of God's children belongs in God's gate class because there are no such thing as God's children that are not gifted by the Holy Spirit can I get an amen to that right and we see here when you have a gift that's so strong we have two tendencies one you rely so much and you pride yourself so much in the strength that you think your strength will always bail you out. My job skills will bail me out. My interview skills will bail me out. How I could kind of work my boss will, work, uh, will, will work, uh, get me out of a bind. And you rely so much on that strength, and you use it only sparingly, and you forget to hone it. You think, I got it made. But when God gives you a gift from where you were last year to five years, ten years, God wants to develop it. And if you don't develop it, it's just going to stay there. Just like I have a piano for my kids. But if they don't hone it, they could have it for 10 years and still be playing. After 10 years. Why? I have a musical. I, I love music, Dad. I love music, Dad. I love Drake, all of these things. Can you play an instrument? No, I love, I'm passionate about music. You have to hone it. Sometimes, well, that's the first sense. We have a gift and you just think, oh. And I want to challenge all of you, whether it be preacher, worship leader, musician. I don't care how much God has gifted you. There's still room for improvement. I don't care how long you pray or how nice or eloquent your prayer. I don't care how much you know the Bible, how many degrees you got coming after your name, PhD, THD, and all of this. There's still room to, if you're alive, you're still supposed to be growing. You're still supposed to be developing. The minute that you stop developing is the minute you start to die. Why do you think I'm getting gray hair now? It shows that I'm still growing. <laughs> I'm growing gray hair. That's what's happening. Why do you think my, my midsection is getting bigger and bigger even though I'm trying to, it shows that I'm alive and I'm growing. And then easily for any one of you or that are gifted in your job, you think you could just coast. Well, God's given me this gift. And Samson, that's the first. Don't you ever coast and take your gifts for granted. You got to work it and hone it. Can I get an amen to that? So point somebody, you better keep working at it. You better keep working at it. You better keep working on it. That's the first thing. The second tendency that we tend to do is the fact that when we go to disappointments, you give up. I, pastor, you don't understand. I've been wanting to join Pastor Sam's worship team. I've been praying and fasting for the last six months. And I auditioned. I fasted three meals before that audition. And Pastor Sam has not called my name yet. <laughs> I guess I hit somewhere else right there. And so what do you do? Instead of playing, you're like, forget it. It's just a pipe dream. I don't see any fruit. Forget it. Next time I see Pat Sam, I'll be like, hey, Pat I'm going to walk away. <laughs> when I see someone else playing guitar, I'll be like, I could do so much better than that person. And you stopped using because you've given up because you haven't seen any hope. That's the second tendency. You go through so much disappointments, 
You're trying this and that, and it's not happening. And you start questioning God's going to say, forget it. I'm not going to use these gifts anymore. You could use your gifts to just bail you out and, just, and you don't hone it, and then you could just give up because you meet disappointments. But I want to challenge you and encourage you because God is always faithful to his word. Can I get an amen to that, right? And there is always an appointed time for everything. If God started it, God's going to develop it. And everything has an appointed development time. To everything, there is an, a season for every activity under the sun. If God started, there's an activity, and you're waiting for it, and you don't see it, and the devil comes and says, you know what? I have two options. Yes, Samson has such a great strength. Maybe I could, he has great passion, he has great abilities, maybe I could make him use it for the wrong purpose. Bail yourself out just for your own self-aggrandizement, self for your own pleasure right there. Use it wrong. Or maybe I could also make you say to him, you know, use it not for your own purpose, but just use it for a good purpose. And you're still off the mark a little bit. Oh, just use it for some good things here and there. Or maybe I could discourage him from doing it at all because I don't see any fruits. You know, like I said, I was at this uh, conference, and um, I must say, uh, 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 um, all of us, uh, we all need to get recharged and encouraged. And, you know, uh, one of the questions that they asked Pastor Rick Warren is, how do you get your time of refreshing? For me, I love to read books, and I love to run, exercise, and it's family time. Those are my three rechargers. And they asked him, you're such a busy pastor. How do you make time of all this? And you know how he gets recharged? Gardening. He has a backyard and gardens, and that's how he just kind of gets his charge. I'm like, wow. I, I, I get disgusted when I get dirt on my hands, but okay, that's, if that works for you, that's great, you know? And, and he's, he shared how one time, uh, years ago, he decided to plant some bamboos. So what do you do? You cut the bamboo, small, and you put it in the ground and you cover it. Then you add fertilizer, then you water it. And he kept watering it. He was being a good gardener. First year, nothing. Second year, nothing. But he kept watering and taking care of it. Third year, nothing. Fourth year, nothing. Everybody say nothing. Fifth year, nothing. Everybody say again, nothing. Sixth year, nothing. Everybody say again, nothing. All right? No thing, okay? And then finally, in the seventh year, you know, God is such a systematic God. Seven is the number of completeness, right? In the seventh year, finally, something came out of the ground. And you know what's so amazing about that? The amazing thing about it is the bamboo sprouted out, and in one day, one day, it sprouted three meters. One day, at the set point of time, it didn't just break out of the ground. It sprouted up three meters in one day. In one week, it grew to nine meters. One week, it grew to nine meters. Just because you don't see anything doesn't mean that God's not working. And when we're supposed to wait upon God, sometimes we give up and we stop using what God, if you want to see a breakthrough in your marriage, you don't just give up and you just, you do what God has asked you to do. Waiting is not passive. You're actively being faithful to what God has called you to do. Just like Pastor Rick Warren kept on watering and tilling that fertile soil and fertilizing it for six years. And finally, even though he didn't see anything, at the seventh year, all of a sudden, baby, God sprouted it all up. It reminds me of what the Bible says. When God does things and it's the right time, he does it swiftly. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. All the years that you've been waiting for, God can make it up in one single day. That's why it says, the, the least that you will become a thousand, the smallest of you can become a mighty nation. That's why the word of God says, despise not the day of small and humble beginnings. Because when you're faithful and you do what God has asked you to do, God will make it bear fruit at the right time. Can I get an amen to that? So I want to challenge all of you that you've tempted to give up. And some of you are just about to give up on what the Lord has given you in talents gifts. But don't you dare give up. As your pastor, it is my job to make sure that we don't just have nice services. It is my job to find where you are, who you are, what gifts you are, what background that you have, and to challenge you to step it up and shine for the glory of Jesus Christ. If I don't do that, I am failing. I'm not here just to be a pastor or a preacher. 
I'm not here just to give a message to get all loud and spit out every Sunday to keep you awake. I'm here because I want to share the word of God in an uncompromised way, challenge you to put your faith in Jesus. And then that's not it. Part of a pastor, you think, you know, it seems glamorous. You come and you preach the message, you prepare. Yes, that is nice. But you know what? It's what I do behind the scenes that makes a church healthy. And I was so convicted of it, you know, because I was reminded at this conference, a lot of people think it's just preaching, preaching, preaching. It's pastoring. So when you visit a person in the hospital, when you do a funeral, when you go and meet with the people, that's what really shows the love. Are you trying with me? Can I get an amen to that? And so we think that, hey, we, we, it, I just need to focus on, it's all the other things in between. And when you're faithful to God in that way, God says, I will do And that's why I'm so excited and I want to challenge you. Let's do this together. Can I get an amen? I want to have a church where the devil can't even set foot in this place because we're united in love, united in praise, united in prayer, united in commitment to help each other, serving one another. The devil comes, don't go there. Don't even dare go there. You get beaten up if you go to revival church. The love and the fellowship and the word and the presence of God is so strong there. And I want to make sure that we have a healthy church in that way. And that's how we do it because I want to make sure every one of you Start using and developing and honing your gifts whatever season you're in. So point to someone and say, you are gifted and talented. You may not know it, but you're gifted and talented. Point to someone and say, you, you may not know it, but you're gifted and talented. Ecclesiastes 10.10 10 says this, if the ax is dull and its edge unsharpened, more strength is needed. But skill will bring success. I was so tempted to bring my sword today. Um, I have a real life sword because my discipleship guys in the East Coast bought. I, I, my wife's teaching. I hide it from my wife because uh, she wanted to get rid of it and give it away to Salvation Army and all that because like, it's too dangerous. And I'm like, honey, the guys from my, one of my discipleships in the East Coast said, Pastor, we are your knights of your round table. So as a, as a, as a gift to you, we got you this sword. I'm like, wow. It was like one of those brave heart swords, you know. And engraved, it says, you're knights of your round table. My wife said, let's get it away. It's too dangerous. <laughs> no, honey, we, 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 we really have to. Uh, uh, these are from these guys. What if they visit me in the, in, from the East Coast? They're going to stay. It's gone. I said, no, you know, what if Colin, you know, Karis are playing around with it? Ah, you know. <laughs> so, no, no, no. And so um, when we moved to our current place, I hid it. <laughs> but she found it. <laughs> what is this? I'm like, honey. I feel so convicted by the Lord, I cannot give away so, you know, what my disciples gave to me. It's, it's a reminder. And so I still have it, but it's dull. It hasn't been sharpened. So one of my excuses, it's, it's not sharpened. But the point of that passage is when you sharpen it, I could probably cut a tree easily because it's so sharp. When it's dull, <laughs> sweating. And so many of us think, well, just by working harder, sweating harder, that you're doing effective work. Actually, if you uh, sharpen it and you're able to make the tree fall down with five strikes instead of 20 strikes, that's more efficient and better, isn't it? So in the same way, God says, if you hone your gifts, even though no one's watching, even though no one's seeing it, God is watching. And the Bible says in Proverbs, do you see a man that is skilled in his work? He will stand before a king. And I don't care if you never go before a human king. You're standing before the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and his name is Jesus Christ. So whether it be an audience of a lot or an audience of one, Jesus, you do it all and hone your gifts for the glory of God. So hone and use those gifts, even through the disappointments. And the third and final point I want to share with you, if we put up on the screen, is the fact that when we are actually being going through all of these things and you have the gifts and the passions. You need the right focus. Everybody say right focus. Point at someone and say you need to focus properly. Or point at someone and say you need to focus properly. Need the right focus for your skills and talents. If you see what I'm trying to go at is this. Samson had passion. He had gifts and talents. But then he had the wrong purpose. He was using it for his own. And God's trying to tell us, I've given you talents and, 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 and passion, but you've got to use it for the right purpose, God's right purpose. But let me, now this point is simply this. It's not enough just to have the right purpose. You also need the right focus. What do I mean by this? I could have, you could put your kids in the best schools, right place, 
the right purpose, learn. But if that child isn't focused on why they're there and what they're doing, what's going to happen? They'll just go through the motions. You put them in the best environment, best opportunities, right place, the right, pla and the right, uh, right environment to do things, and the right purpose for that. But if their focus is wrong, and they're like, hey, girl, what's up? I know your legs have been running and tired because you've been running through my mind all day long. No? And you got the wrong focus. You could be at the right place doing the right thing, but still not achieve God's purpose. Are you trapped with me? Can I get an amen, right? So you need the right focus. You could be married to the right person. Hello? In the right marriage, living in the right place. But if your focus is wrong, you're focused on all the wrong things that the other person is doing, finding faults, your focus is wrong, you'll never be able to fulfill everything God intended. You could be at the right job and doing the right thing, but your focus is wrong. You get involved with the gossip and the politics and all that, you'll never fulfill God's purpose. You could be at the right church under the great preaching and worship and great fellowship, and you could be at the right place doing the right, you could even be serving, but if your focus is not on the right thing, God, you could be missing out. So that's why Samson had the gifts and the talents, and God's trying to correct them, do the right purpose. But even still, we see here that God's saying, you need the right focus as well. And we notice and see that when God wants us to have the right focus, it's because the focus makes all the difference in the world. Because, think about it this way, I posted this uh, a couple of weeks ago, and it got actually one of the mo more likes, than, and, and I noticed that almost all the people liked it were pastors or church leaders. Because being in the right place, being with the right people, and doing the right thing doesn't necessarily guarantee that you're going to actually be able to overcome everything and become all that God wants you to be. Because I posted this thing. It's about Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot, the disciple who spent three years and they betrayed Jesus. Think about this. Judas had the best pastor, Jesus himself. The best leader, Jesus himself. The best teacher, Jesus himself. The wisest and best friend, Jesus himself. And yet, yet Judas still failed. The problem isn't the leadership or the church you go to. If your attitude doesn't change or your character transform, you will always be the same. So you need the right focus. And I shared with you a couple years ago about how God says we need to renew our minds and how I share with you on, the air, on an airplane, the altimeter, the, the, the determinant where the direction is also actually called the attitude meter. That when your attitude is down, you're going to go down. When your attitude is up, you're going to go up. And that's why we need to focus not just on the right things, because you could be doing just good things, and you could still not be focused on, upon God, but slightly off. You need to be focused directly upon Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Can I get an amen to that? That's why we need the right focus. Everybody shout right focus, okay? Right focus. Somebody even shout louder, right focus, okay? When you're not right focused and you're driving, you look somewhere else, you will veer off. When you keep looking, if I say, look at this, Focus upon the R here. What happens? Everything else in the periphery becomes blurry. So when we look at just even the, the good things but not focused upon God, God becomes blurry in our lives. Because we're focused upon, hey, I'm focused upon this thing or that thing, but not necessarily upon God. And that's why we need to understand and be focused on the right things, and that's God and God alone. You know, I came upon the story. There was a gang of thieves that broke into a jewelry store. And you would think they would take everything, but they didn't steal anything that day. That night, they broke into a jewelry store, and instead of stealing anything, they switched the price tags. They put the most expensive jewelry and put the cheapest prices on there. And they got the cheapest jewelry and put the most expensive price on there. And they left. And the next day, People came and nobody noticed the difference and people were spending huge amounts of money to buy cheap junk. And others were paying only a couple of dollars for incredibly expensive jewelry. Someone has switched the tags on, on that jewelry store and let me share with you this as well. Somebody called the devil has switched the price tags here on earth. And we're spending so much on things that are actually cheap. And God wants to write it on and make sure that we have the right focus. That we need to focus upon the thing that is timeless. Live for something that will be eternal in that way. 
And I want to say this because if you focus upon God and you do the things that God wants you to do and you're rightly focused upon God, even the smallest half a degree being off mark, NASA scientists says, will actually miss actually a rocket from missing the whole planet of Mars. Just half a degree off. So that's why every day we need to come back to the Lord. That's why the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge on him and he will make your path straight. That's why the Bible says, for we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher and perfecter of our faith. That when you are lost, you focus upon God, God will see you through. And when you see you through, God will make every disappointment into his appointed time of God's glory. Can I get an amen to that? You're never late when you focus upon Jesus. You're never behind when you focus upon Jesus. God makes past become the present. And God will make up for anything that is lost in that way. So I want to challenge you as I close. Don't ever give up, but trust in God. Don't ever give up because of your disappointments. Upset your disappointments by focusing all your heart on Jesus and his power. Upset what your power, human power cannot do and focus upon the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords whose power can make anything possible at any time, in any person, in any place. Can I get an amen to that? Upset your disappointment because the devil wants you to say, woe is me. But you come before God and say, when I fix my eyes on you, everything else, my problems become blurry in light of the glory of the light of Jesus Christ. Therefore, when I fix my eyes on you, all my problems go into the proper perspective because you are great and my problems become smaller. So when you trust in God in that way, God will never let you down. As I close, let me share with you a true story about this missionary from Congo. And in this, in this story, it just talks about how God does really work in our lives and we need to be able to trust the Lord in this way. And this, um, this missionary who had been uh, from England, who had served for years in the Belgian Congo, um, so a medical missionary, and they were taking care of all these orphans. And in this orphanage, there was a lady who was a mom who was giving birth. She had a two-year-old kid, and she was giving birth to a newborn. And she got sick during the delivery, and they tried to do everything, but the mother died after the delivery. So there was a newborn baby and then the two-year-old. And the baby was born prematurely because of, there were a lot of complications. So they tried to do everything, but it was out in the in middle of uh, uh, in the Congo. And so they didn't have an incubator, they didn't have the electricity for all of these things. And notice that because the baby was premature, they needed to make sure that the baby was warm. And they had just this one rubber water uh, bottle to keep it warm. And one of the nurses came and said, I'm sorry, but today we dropped it and it broke. We have no water bottle. How are we going to keep the baby warm? And even though it's in Africa, at nighttime it will get cold. And so they decided they're going to keep the baby near the fire without harming the baby. And then another person would lie just in, uh, between it, uh, the baby in between, and then the door so that the draft, they could try to block the draft. And because it was an orphanage, they went to raise faith. This missionary came and gathered around 30, 40 of the orphan kids and said, on a, um, at noon the next day, and said, we need to pray. Let's pray to God for God's help. And there was a 10-year-old girl who came and said, let's pray. Okay, we'll pray. And then she had a bold, audacious prayer. And she said, God, you know that we need a hot water bottle for this baby. Would you come and provide? And in fact, God, I believe that you're going to provide a baby doll for the two-year-old who's crying right now because she lost her mother. And the nurse actually admitted and said, she couldn't say amen. Because you know why? She had been out in the mission field for four years and never got any care package. Let alone a water bottle in the middle of hot Africa or the daytime? They don't need a water bottle. So she couldn't say muster and amen. It was around noon and then she had to go teach at a, uh, a certain place. And then she got word that a car came to her, their residence and they dropped off a box. So lady went to it and then gathered all the kids and, they, and it was a 22 pound box big and they opened it carefully and they opened it and they folded the wrapping paper or whatever the package paper, paper was and they opened it and there were some clothes there was some um, food and there were some other things and the kids were getting bored like uh. and then the missionary was reaching in and feeling in 
and felt, no, oh, is this actually what I think it is? And she put it out, and it was a warm water bottle, hot water bottle. And she was amazed. Why in the world, how in the world do they know that we needed a hot water bottle? And then that 10-year-old girl says, you see, God answers our prayers. Then she said, I know that God has probably put a baby doll in this box as well. So she reached down, rumbled up, and took out a baby doll. And everybody was praising God, and this missionary was so humble. She found out that that package had been delivered five months ago by a Sunday school teacher that she had trained. And five months ago, the, the church decided, let's pack and send these things. And it took five months to finally to get there. And the amazing thing is, that girl said that prayer that afternoon at 12 noon. And the package that had been sent five months ago finally arrived. You see how when we pray, God's already been working in the past, and he's going to make it all right. Are you trying to me? Can I get an amen? So in the same way, whatever you're waiting for, whatever you be faithful to the Lord. Hone your gifts. And keep being faithful and have the right focus upon God. Because when you do so, God has already called something in the past that you think and nothing happened, but God's bringing it closer and closer to that appointed time. Can I get an amen to that? And so whatever you don't see, even though the ground seems like there's nothing going to be born, those who are faithful, God says, to those who are faithful, I will show myself faithful, says God. And when you're faithful with the Lord has given to you, you will see that praise and glory shall arise from the ashes of your ground even right now. If you receive that today, can it get a loud amen today? Amen. So I want to ask you today, let's put our faith and trust in the Lord and let's upset all the disappointments. If you're disappointed in life today, today you could leave here filled with the joy of God. Your circumstances may not change, but your heart condition did because you gave it and focused upon the Lord. And if you do that, that's all that God wants. He doesn't want anything more than you. He wants your heart. Because if you have your, he has your heart, he has everything in your life. And he can start to work it out for good. Can we all stand?